Hey, I've got good news for Kenny. We have a group for that in CR. <laughs> really, uh, none of us can fix ourselves, can we? And, and I know there's a, a lot of effort to try to, to fix even the problems in our own country. It, you know, uh, we are celebrating uh, the fact that we're always going to remember what happened uh, September 11th, the same day, 15 years ago, uh, when the towers were crashed into by two planes, another plane targeted the Pentagon, uh, and a final plane was said to be headed for the White House uh, when some brave individuals kept that plane from reaching its destination. We said we would never forget, and we would never forget several things, I think. And never forget the depths uh, of evil. You know, I, I was tempted uh, to show some pictures of, of the towers as they were hit. And in those pictures, these are actual photographs, actual photographs in the flames uh, from the pictures. You can distinguish what looks like a horrible, evil, devilish face. And, and then later, as the towers smoked before they fell, uh, you can distinguish very easily in another picture, again, uh, what looks like a devilish face. I, I don't know that the, the devil, quote, was showing his face, but I think he was showing his intention, which is only evil continually. And we, certainly as a nation, experienced a horrific event uh, some 15 years ago. Uh, to bring it up to date, we have uh, sports uh, figures in our day to day uh, who refuse to uh, stand in, uh, as the singing of our national anthem is presented it before each sports game. Uh, they do it for reasons of their own choosing, and, and they see problems and difficulties within our society. And I'm not surprised because I see problems and difficulties within our society uh, as well. Uh, but I do believe that God has blessed us as a nation. I do believe that God has uh, used this nation to make a tremendous impact on the world for good. Uh, so in contrast uh, to uh, their actions, I'm going to ask if you feel led to, if you feel okay with it, I'm going to ask that you would stand on the anniversary of this a terrible event in, in our nation's history that you would stand in honor of that event and say with me the pledge to allegiance uh, to our American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, we do thank you uh, for our nation. We do thank you that this nation has uh, been established on very strong Christian principles of belief in you that so many of our founding fathers, uh, Lord, put within our constitution, put within our Bill of Rights, put within the many different documents, uh, Lord, indications of their faith and their trust and their belief uh, that you have established this nation. Father, I pray that as we see this nation go forth, that, Lord, as we uh, now are, are into this grand experiment, as they recounted it, uh, Lord, that we are into this uh, spirit, uh, to this experiment of democracy, that some 200 years later, Lord, that we would continue to see America be a force for good in the world. Lord, I know there's so many things, so many issues, so many reasons uh, why we would think that our country is, is headed the wrong direction. But Father, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would bring about a revival in our nation that might put us back in the right direction. Lord, I don't believe that you necessarily are through with us yet. But Lord, I pray before judgment comes that we would again receive your mercy. And be able uh, to be, Lord, good people in a world of, of hurt and, and hopelessness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things I think you might agree with me is that 
Uh, there are many things that uh, are involved in our world today, uh, there are many things involved in our country even today, uh, that are not uh, as God would intend them to be. That people treat other people unjustly, that people discriminate and, and do all kinds of evil uh, in our country today. And because of that, uh, because of that, I think we can begin to understand that someday God's going to have his fill and bring judgment uh, upon America. Now, I'm not praying, and I'm certainly not a prophet, and I don't want that time to come anytime soon. But I do read in the Bible about a nation whom God loved, about a nation that was established upon his laws, about a nation that was meant to be a missionary nation to the world, about a nation that he called his very own people, and I read about how they sub, uh, subsequently, over many years, began to separate themselves from the God who founded them. And as they began to do that, God warned of impending judgment. God warned them that there was a time that there was going to come where they would no longer be a nation, where there was a time that was going to come where they would even be taken over by nations more evil than they were, but that it was because of the judgment upon their sin. And we know that nation to be Israel. When we read about their history, we find that after they were divided into two kingdoms, after the time of David, during Rehoboam's, uh, David's son's uh, poor decisions, there was split the nation into ten tribes, and to two and a half tribes. And, and that, that split resulted in the ten tribes of Israel uh, being uh, not closely guided and led by a, a child of David or a, a, a kingly line, and them drifting away rather swiftly from the things of God, setting up idols and, and worshiping uh, in ways that were contrary to the ways that God had, had uh, suggested. And soon after that, in our, after much warning and many prophets saying, things need to turn around, better turn to God, they didn't, and Assyria came and took them over. Uh, because of that, they were deported into many different nations, and, and other peoples were settled into their land. And we have the Samaritans who we read about it during Jesus' time because uh, of that judgment on the nation of Israel. But we also read that the nation of Judah, even though they were led by David's sons and, and were perhaps for a while longer associated with God, eventually they fell away as well. Uh, and it was time now for the prophets to warn them of impending judgment. Babylonia was going to come in and take over their nation and was going to spread them throughout the world and was going to impact their lives in terrific way. Their nation would be no more. Uh, Habakkuk was one of those prophets. He prophesied about the same time as Jeremiah. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. And I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes while you find it. <laughs> because uh, the book of Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. Uh, and though Habakkuk didn't have a large volume of things to say, and you only found him on a couple pages of your Bible, now what he had to say was very important impactful and very important and I believe speaks to our situation today. I don't know what you believe about America. I believe that I can uh, back it up in historical documentation that America was founded uh, by primarily very godly men. That America was founded upon principles and of democracy and principles of right and justice based on God's word that we have a Judean uh, Christian background uh, as a country. 
uh, that, that we uh, as a country have enjoyed many years of success in part because we were founded uh, on those principles. I, I, I think secondly, I can say you know, from reading more recent history that America has certainly been blessed. Couldn't you say that? Of all the nations of the world, I would say America has received the, the most significant blessings throughout our history as a country. Uh, we've been blessed financially. We've been blessed uh, in, in many different ways. But I would say if you come to the present time, not so much in history, and you read your newspapers and you read, you want know newspapers are? Does anybody know what a newspaper is? Okay. Uh, anybody over 30 or so remembers newspapers? Uh, or you read on the internet, or, or you, you read on your phones, uh, present history today, uh, you will find uh, there that uh, uh, times are different for us as a nation. That we have made many different decisions as a people uh, through our political structure, just like Israel did through their political structure. And America is in danger today. I don't think I have to be a prophet to say that if we continue to go the direction we're going, that ju God's judgment will fall upon America. And I think we need to heed the words that God spoke to his people Israel, that God spoke to the 12 tribes, the two kingdoms, that he spoke to them before their demise. We need to hear that as a nation today. And we need to understand that it need not be our fate that we fall into the hands of a righteous God and to his judgment right now. That instead of that, we can turn to him and experience something completely different than the judgment that is sorely due, that is sorely ours, that is exclusively perhaps of all the nations that we're responsible for that judgment that he wants to, to give to us something different. I, I, I want to uh, share with you a message uh, about uh, praying for revival. What, is it, what should we do to prepare for revival? How do we pray for revival? We have revival services scheduled uh, at the end of this month, but there will only be meetings unless God visits us, unless the Holy Spirit comes down, unless our hearts are changed, because revival has to begin in God's church before it can affect the community. America needs revival. If you're a Christian here today, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then surely your heart is crying out with other Christians today for America to have revival in their experience with God. Surely your heart is crying out, not for a political solution, not for electing uh, some savior that's going to come to us from a political uh, system, but a savior is going, that's going to come to us from heaven. The God who visits our nations and works with the leaders of our nation and revives his people in the churches of our nations so that he can revive the communities of our nation. You see, I don't think revival's going to come from the top down. I think the only way God does revival is from the bottom up. Right? And we have to be revived if our nation stands a chance. Uh, I, have you found Habakkuk? Uh, Habakkuk chapter 3. I, I'm going to spoil it for you. It's actually going to be up on the screen. <laughs> If you haven't found it, don't worry about it. <laughs> my most embarrassing moment in my life was when I was preaching up in Oregon, a previous church, and my mom was visiting for the first time. And it was Mother's Day. And I chose to put, preach out of the book of Ruth. And we had two services because God had blessed us so much. And the first service went great, famously, but she wasn't in the first service. It was time for the second service. And I have a practice right now. See, I, I cheat a little. I, I put this piece of paper, my sermon notes, uh, right at the right text. 
So I don't have to worry about finding Habakkuk. I've already found it. <laughs> I didn't back then. And so I didn't have that passage marked out of Ruth. And that day, someone had stolen the book of Ruth out of my Bible. <laughs> so I began to, to do some preliminary stuff, and some of us call it stalling, <laughs> and talk about Mother's Day and how wonderful it was and stuff like that. And all the time I'm panicking as I'm looking through <laughs> my Bible. And I, I didn't have enough presence of mind to realize there's a table of contents. You can turn to the table of contents and find any book of the Bible pretty easily. But I didn't have enough presence of mind to do that. And so I'm, I'm panicking. And finally, finally, as I've killed all the time I can, everybody has realized oh, what's going on. <laughs> I'm not hiding anything from anybody at this point. Some little boy comes up from the congregation and says, Here, Pastor, you can use mine. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> As a pastor, that's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> I went ahead and preached a sermon. My mom loved me anyway. I want you to know. <laughs> For some reason, she hasn't caught on yet. <laughs> no, she's in heaven with the Lord, but, but she loved me anyway. I, I, I think it's important uh, here as we turn to this book, Habakkuk chapter 3. It's on the screen. Would you please stand in the honor of God's word as we read it together? A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigeneth. Now, what does that mean, Kenny? Uh, it's a musical notation. I don't know what it means. Uh, no, never mind. <laughs> no, nobody does. <laughs> nobody knows what that means. But it was a prayer that was recounted over and over in the worship of Israel because it became very important uh, to them. Uh, here Habakkuk says, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Teman, and the Holy Spirit, Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens, and the whole earth is full of his praise. And if you read those next few verses, it, it extols God all the more. Uh, and that's important as we consider this passage uh, together. Would you bow uh, with me once again in prayer? Father, we pray you'd add your blessing to this understanding of your word, that you would speak to our hearts today as only you can. And Lord, we pray that you would guide our thoughts as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Revival, I believe, comes when we see God for who he really is. You know, our lives get so full. Our lives get so busy. Uh, we begin to focus on all different kinds of things in our lives. You know, we have work responsibilities. We have family responsibilities. We have social responsibilities. We have uh, all these different kinds of, of things that draw our attention, that take our energy, that oftentimes, oftentimes we fail to see God, to see God at work around us, to see God moving in his church, to see God moving in his community. We fail to recognize God. And Habakkuk was in that position. Uh, he understood the judgments of God. Uh, he heard from uh, what Jeremiah was saying, his contemporary, about what was going to be the fate of Judah. Uh, and it was all bad news. It was all difficult news to hear. You see, the report was about the Babylonians coming in and executing God's judgment on the people of Judah. You know, Judah didn't fall to the Babylonians. Judah fell to the judgment of God. The Babylonians wouldn't have had a chance if Judah would have been where they should be with God. America, as did Rome, I don't believe will fall because some outsized force comes uh, and attacks it ultimately. Yes, there were the barbarians that attacked Rome eventually, but Rome was so weakened before they attacked 
because they deteriorated from the inside. That's what happened to Judah. And when the report has come to Habakkuk, the report of what's going to happen uh, in these coming days, when that report is known to be God's judgment on the people, it makes him uh, very fearful, very fearful, because he knows God. I, I don't think, if our God is a God of love, if our God is a God who accepts everybody like they are, if I, I now you're beginning to say, well, isn't that our God? And I would say to you, yes, those are qualities of our God. But if that's all you see in God, we are missing the real opportunity to see God as he really is. If all you see is his love and his mercy and you miss his judgment, you miss his holiness, you miss his moral fiber and moral character that must deal with sin, then you don't have a true picture of God. I, I, yesterday, as, as Kim mentioned, man, I was praising God. It was beautiful to come over from Walcott to go up to Walden. Walden's up above Steamboat Springs and then come back through Steamboat Springs and, and down through Craig. And Man, we saw some beautiful evidence of our Creator God. Herds of antelope and, and, and different creatures out there in God's beautiful creation. But the one that really got us, and he already mentioned to you, was that big, beautiful bull moose. I have never seen a bull moose in the wild before. And I have never seen a more beautiful animal in all the animals I have seen. He was about 15 yards away initially. And then he ran parallel to where we were driving. So we got to see his muscles move through that beautiful black fur. I, I didn't know they came in black, but this beautiful moose. And I want you to know, as we looked at that, all of us, I believe, in, in our bus thought in our minds, what a great God <laughs> we have. What a creator. And he could create such a powerful animal. That, his back was that high. <laughs> such a powerful animal. Such a a big, beautiful creation of God. Well, we got to see the mountains, and, and boy, they're just starting to change color up there. And we're going to see more of that throughout this year, right? We're going we're gonna to look at God's creation and glorify God, aren't we? How can you but do that? We see God in, as creator. And we see God as sustainer as well, Right? He set the world in motion, and he didn't just wind it up and walk away. He's still at work in the world today. I, I believe he's at work through those two mission groups. They went up with a purpose in their heart to serve the Lord, and they did. They did. I'd hate to work with a group we had every day. I, they, they wore me out in four and a half hours. I can't imagine what it would be we'd like to work a whole day, right? <laughs> that was tough. Uh, they, I've never seen a group of people work harder in, in really just serving God and, and serving other people. There are some elderly people who will be able to take the money they would have had to spend on gas to heat their home, and they'll be able to buy food that they wouldn't be able to have without it. Isn't that great? Because of the ministry of some of your fellow Christian brothers and sisters here, because of the ministry of that church up there who delivers this firewood to the elderly people in the town of Walden. That's worthwhile, isn't it? That's something important. That's something where God is at work. And every one of us just saw the hand of God. Believe me, 12 of us working in concert. You know, some of these guys are hard to work with. Right, Tom? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 12 of us working in concert to, to see the Lord's will being done. It was, it was a great time. It was a great experience. It was God at work in the present. And next week, 
next week at the early service. I don't know why the early service seems to have gotten to be the bigger service for some reason. I guess, uh, I guess they get, people get up earlier today than they used to. I always expected this service to be the largest. But, but next week, if you come to the early service, and maybe that's why I keep advertising it, uh, if you come to the early service, you'll see a fellow who's been attending our church for two or three months now whose life has radically been changed. He's in his 40s, and he's going to be baptized for the first time next week, next Sunday morning. Isn't that great? And, and, and he and his friend and other uh, in our church will tell you how God is at work to, to change their lives. God is at work in the present, folks, and we need to glorify him for that. Amen? Isn't it great to see God sustaining his creation, including us, including his greatest act of creation, people, he is in the work sustaining his creation. But you know there's going to come a time when time will be no more. There's going to come a time when God will bring about the completion of all that we know and all that we see. Ultimately, we are told in the Bible, we study about it on Sunday nights in our Revelation class, we are told in the Bible that there's going to come a time when God's judgment will come. Now, I don't like to see God that way. That is not a pleasant picture of God for me when I think about his judgment. And yet, if I recognize all the other good things about God, I must recognize this good thing as well. Because it's not a bad thing. God could not be holy unless he was just. And God could not be just unless there was a payment for sin. Now, God is loving and merciful, so he provided the remedy for that payment. But he has to be just in enacting judgment because of the rebellion and sinfulness of man. We think back to, night, to uh, September 11th, 2001, and we think about the evilness of those people involved in that. And I'm telling you, they are going to face God someday and face his judgment. We don't have to enact revenge on them. and We can't, obviously, they're dead, but they are going to face God someday. Honestly, I tell you, every one of us is going to face God someday. And if our sins are not forgiven, we will stand accountable for our sins before him someday. I, I, I want you to know that God deserves to be held in awe. He deserves to be held in awe. But he also, when hearing about his judgment, when hearing about that part of God's nature, when understanding who God really is, there ought to also be a little bit of fear. Now, I don't believe it ought to be fear on the behalf of Christians worried about our future. Because we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Because Jesus has saved our souls. And isn't that great? But aren't we selfish if we're only concerned about ourselves? Shouldn't we be in fear for our family members who don't know Christ? Shouldn't we be in fear for our loved ones who don't know Christ? Shouldn't we be in fear of God's judgment for our community that doesn't know Christ? And for ultimately our nation, should not we be in fear of God's judgment? I, I, I believe we should. I believe we should. That's, that's where Habakkuk found himself. He found himself recognizing God, being awed by God. And, and these verses after this recount his awe. Before now, in the chapters preceding this, He's wondering why this could ever happen, and now he recognizes it must happen. And he is fearful for his people. He's fearful for what's going to happen to them. I believe we need to be, in some sense, in the same way, fearful for what God's judgment coming upon our nation. And as Habakkuk did, what, what did he say? Uh, he says there in verse 2, uh, I, I heard the report about you, about thee, and I fear. 
O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the year. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. What's he crying out here for? He's crying out for revival. He said, Lord, revive your work. Don't let it be too late. Don't let the judgment fall yet. Revive your work. That's my plea to, for us today to pray for revival, not just in our church, not just through a week of meetings. I, I really sincerely hope that you will pray with me that we will have revival in our nation, that it might begin in his church because it has to begin with us, right? Just as I stated before, it's, the answer is not from the top down. I hope it was in this sermon. It might have been in the previous one. <laughs> The answer is from the bottom up. Folks, we are that base. We are, as the church of Jesus Christ here in this community, we are the ones who need to be on our knees praying to God for revival. Praying that God will change the things before it's too late. Here, a uh, passage following this in in verse 13, it says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet, and makes me walk on my high places. Uh, for the choir director. I, I believe this is more than just Kenny's verse. But, but that passage had spoken to each of us. That's the way we should feel. If things are falling apart, we still know God's in charge. Amen. Amen? And even though our nation is headed perhaps the wrong direction in so many areas, and, and I'm sure I could agree uh, with you that there is an inequity, there are problems in, in so many different arenas in our nation. Though our nation is declining and demoralizing and ultimately diminishing, I believe God's still in control, don't you? And I believe we can cry out to God on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our church, on behalf of our community. We can cry out to God and we can still see him revive his mercy and his compassion uh, for us. I, I think we have to be able to understand that revival comes in God's time. As, as he has uh, declared here, as he has encouraged us, when we talk about reviving our work, we're really remembering what it used to be like. You can't revive something that's never been. That relationship that you had with Jesus when you were first saved, do you remember that? I remember like I was yesterday. It was in Newcastle at First Baptist Church. I was going to a revival meeting, and my family hadn't been going to church for a long time. But for some reason, we were going to this one. My sisters and brothers, some of them married and gone, but they came back for this revival. I, I remember as a 12-year-old boy, I remember God speaking to my heart one night. And as a Harris, I stubbornly refused <laughs> to submit <laughs> to God speaking to my heart. And I hung on to the pew. I remember how <laughs> there must have been nail prints or fingernail prints in that pew after that night because I was going up in front of all those people. That was scary to me. Uh, but I knew what I needed to do and I couldn't wait for revival to begin the next night. And I couldn't wait for that silly preacher to get done saying what he was saying because <laughs> I had already made a decision in my heart and I knew what I needed to do. Maybe you're in that same position, not about waiting for the preacher to get done with what he's saying uh, it didn't mean that part <laughs> but maybe you're in that position where you know what God wants you to do you know what you need to do and I don't remember that first step I mean I don't remember any of the steps after the first step I remember taking the first step out and then I remember being up front and I remember the pastor praying with me and I remember this tremendous weight. Twelve years old, I was packing all this stuff. 
I remember this tremendous weight being gone from my shoulders as the Lord forgave me of my sins. I, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember, I remember how it was. And I remember how I was so excited about the Lord. I remember I would have done anything back then for him, but I remember also that things began to fade when I got back into the real world. I was not too far from going to high school, and I figured out what it takes to be popular in high school. You just have to do what the popular kids do, and none of it was good. (laughs) And so that's what I began to do. I began to do what the popular kids do, and I found this standing with the kids in my grade. I know many of them I know today, and uh, and they're in this community, so you can confirm that I did some bad things if you would like. And some have volunteered to come and give a public testimony of (laughs) of all the bad things I've done. (laughs) I've uh, I've told them, yeah, they already know, but you're welcome to share if you want. but I know what he did to me. And it didn't, it, it was almost at the loss of my marriage when Chris and I had decided to divorce each other that I finally came back to him. I remembered what he meant to me in the past and I was revived. I had a revival in my heart, in my soul. You may be here today. You know Christ has done something for you in the past, but there's not the right evidence of it in the present. Maybe today you need to look back and see what he's done. To hear the report from the Lord, what you mean to him, and what he has saved you from. I think we need to revive the work in the midst of the years, he said. Uh, he asked God to work in the present, in the midst of this time. Uh, with what's going on. Revive itself means to look back, but here he's asking for that kind of relationship to bring back that kind of relationship, to come back to that kind of relationship. Maybe you're here today and your prayer would be to him to revive in the midst of the years your heart, your relationship with him. Revival comes how and when God wants it. Uh, Here the prophet says, there's going to be revival come. I'd rather not it come through wrath, but I'd rather it come through mercy. Now in the life of the nation that he's prophesying to, it came through wrath. The nation was overcome. The people were scattered. The people did experience a, a, a terrible, terrible a loss of their national identity, a loss of their national presence, a loss of their national pride, a personal loss of all possessions uh, and, and standing in their community. And they were scattered throughout the world. In God's wrath, he brought them back to himself. Seventy years later, they came back into the land. To repeat the whole thing again, in 1948, they came back into the land again. Revive. God's wrath in the midst of wrath. Sometimes the only way we get on our knees is to have our legs knocked out from under us. Right? Sometimes it has to be through judgment that we finally turn back to God. The prophet asks for mercy in the midst of wrath. And we so need to ask for mercy in the midst of wrath. I'll tell you, I've learned an interesting thing about us. A bird sleeping on a perch. Have you ever noticed how, how birds can, can be on a, a little bitty limb and, and they somehow, they fall asleep and they stay upright? How is that possible? I can hardly stay in a big king-sized bed <laughs> through the whole night. <laughs> uh, how do they stay on that little bitty limb? Well, scientists have studied that and, and what it is is, is uh, when they bend their knees just a little bit, there are tendons in their legs that lock their claws so that when they bend their knees and fall asleep, they crutch or they catch and, and clasp that limb and so greatly that they stay in that position all night long. And when they wake up and get off their knees, they can fly. Now I want you to think about that for us Christians. Think about that. 
what should we do? Let's bend our knees before God and receive the strength to be stable no matter what happens around us. Let's get on our knees before God so that when we wake up, when we receive His Word, when we get right with Him, we can fly. We can fly. It takes the bending of the knee to be able to fly the next day, to have the strength to fly. Folks, it takes a bending of our knee to get the strength we need to fly like God wants us to fly, to be revived in our hearts and in our souls. And we need to bend that same knee. Uh, We need to understand that revival comes when God's people pray. Uh, this passage out of Second Chronicles seven thirteen through 14. And it's in the dedication of, of the temple. Solomon has built this wonderful temple. It's the highlight of all of the Israelites' life. I mean, this is the day of, that they are more happy than they will have ever been or will ever be, perhaps. Uh, this is the day that the dedication of the temple of God is being performed. And Solomon prays to God in his dedication to the temple, and God answers Solomon back. This is God's answer. He says, If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Isn't that a verse we need to hear in America today? Isn't that a verse we need to hear in New Life Fellowship today? Isn't that a verse we need to hear in our own hearts today? Has the land been devoured? Are there things wrong with our country? Are there things wrong in our community? Uh, Are perhaps have perhaps we moved away from God in our hearts we need to hear God's remedy if my people who are called by my name there's a relationship that was there before this is talking about revival the relationship that was there before if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves that is so hard to do you know Kenny's song put it well I can't fix myself right That's the humbling that we need to realize we can't do it ourselves. My people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and shall pray, pray and seek my face. We know where the answer comes from. Like Habakkuk, Habakkuk, we are looking to an exalted God. We understand who he is. We understand our resources in him. We can't fix ourselves. We know who can fix us. And it's God. Seek my face and turn from their wicked way. There must be repentance for there to be revival. We have to recognize that we're going the wrong way before we can go the right way. You can be lost up in the woods. And as long as you don't recognize you're lost, you're happy as can be. (laughs) But you're no safer than you were. You have to recognize your loss in order to be found, right? In order to seek help, you have to recognize your loss. We have to do that in our hearts as well. We must turn from our wicked way. And what does God promise us? I love this. He will hear from heaven. Isn't that wonderful to know that God's going to hear us? That he will forgive our sins. And boy, only God can do that. Amen. And that he will heal Our hearts is implied in that. But here he's talking to his people. He says, I will heal their land as well. What a promise from God. And it's a promise that we must recognize uh, comes when God's people pray. No great revival, no great awakening, nothing has touched our nation and made a difference in our nation did not come except by an act of God's people praying. We say we love America. Let's get on our knees. 
We say we believe in our country. Let's pray to the one who can make a difference in our country. Let's get on our knees before God. What do we need to pray for? For forgiveness. That passage says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it wasn't just written to people who don't know Christ. As a matter of fact, the context of that passage is for those of us who are Christians. And it's speaking of a revival happening in our hearts because he'll forgive our sins and cleanse us and things will be made right when we pray to him. For mercy, uh, for mercy, Habakkuk prays for mercy for the folks. And with judgment, would you bring also your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness? As we respond to your judgment, as we call on your name humbly before you, confessing our sin, seeking your face, will you bring your healing into our life? For mercy, for strength, for strength, because we can't do it by ourselves. We can't heal our problems by ourselves, else we would have already done it, probably, right? How many have ever been on a self-improvement kick? <laughs> Certainly we all have, probably. We can't do it by ourselves, ultimately. We need God to help us with this. And finally, for others, for others. I, my son, big birdie guy, you know, you, some of you met him, 50-something inch chest, weightlifter, all these different things. Big birdie guy, tattoos from top to bottom. <laughs> big birdie guy, motorcycle rider, he loves motorcycles, uh, those kinds of things. And when he was young, way before he should have, his entire purpose in life was to have a family because he loved kids. I don't know how he got such a, a purpose in his heart, but, but that's what he wanted to do. He wasn't really interested that much in the girl thing because back then girls had uh, disease problems. Cooties is what we used to call them. I mean, <laughs> when we were young. <laughs> now, I know girls really don't have that, so I'm not trying to lay that on you, but that's kind of how we guys felt. And so it wasn't really about the girl at all. It was about the family. It was about the kids. And, and as a young teenager, uh, my grandson was born, uh, my oldest grandson, Robert. Uh, and our son came to his mom and was concerned. He said, Mom, said, I love Robert so much. And he would, he would attend to Robert's every need. I mean, he, he was really involved in that baby's life. He said, I love Robert so much. He said, I'm not going to have any love left for my own kids. <laughs> How can I love my own kids when I love him so much? And his mom wisely stated, that love is multiplied, it's not divided. It's not divided. And when I think about that, I, th I think of, of how we should feel about others. How we should feel about others. We ought to love them. Oh, we get so selfishly minded in our own time, our own schedule, our own activities, our, all the things that we're doing. Do we think about our family and our friends and the neighbors and the people around us? We may think, well, I don't have that much love to share. Love's not divided. It's multiplied. And the more you share it, the more you have. And the more you care for others, the more love you have to care for others. Honestly, the more they care for you, but that's a side benefit, amen? Isn't that wonderful? But it's to be multiplied. So when we're thinking about this revival coming, we think of the revival coming to our own heart and changing us. But we also ought to think about those around us because this world needs revival. Amen? And I, I, I always state this, well, I don't want the family circle to be unbroken in heaven. You know, unless you know that old gospel song, it just doesn't really bear a lot of weight. And I apologize to all of you I've been sharing that with for so long. And if you have never heard that gospel song, I heard it again when Jim and I were in here working and he was playing it on the, 
on the sound system. Uh, will the family circle, will the circle be unbroken by and by? I, I pray that my family will all have a relationship with Jesus that ensures that they go to heaven to be with him forever. I pray that for my family because I love my family. Uh, and I pray that for my neighbors. I can tell you the names of several of my neighbors I've been praying for for a long time. Some of them have responded and some of them come to our church in, on occasion. Uh, I pray that for my neighbors. I pray that for my community. I pray that for my nation as well. We need to care about where, what others are, where they're going to spend eternity, what they're going to do. Amen? Amen. We need a revival. We need a revival. And it has to begin right here. It has to begin right here before it can affect what's out there. Right? It has to begin right here. My heart and yours. It has to begin in this church so that we can affect this community so that our nation has a chance. It's bottom up, folks. I hope you'll vote this election cycle. But I know the answer is not top down. I know the answer is bottom up. We need to get our hearts right with the Lord and make a difference right here and right now. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Father, for being with us today. And Lord, I know that you said where two or, or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. And Lord, so we know that you're with us because we have gathered here to worship and to praise you and to hear from you. I pray, Lord, that that you will have been heard from. Even if none of my words were heard, Father, I pray that your Spirit's word were loud in our hearts and loud in our ears. Lord, that you would speak to us today. That you would convict us of our own need for revival. That ultimately, Lord, you would convict our church of praying for revival for our church and for our community. Lord, I pray that, that you would speak as only you can in the midst of our hearts and in our, your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.